Uh, probably everybody's been asked that question. You know, who's your favorite president? Or who would you like to eat a meal with you know, as president? And not just living with, but any any president, if they're all alive. And I, I don't know, the, the standard answer are probably the big ones, you know. Uh, and uh, if you're kind of in the natural lands, working for a park or something, you'd say, oh, TDR, you know, he espouses the virtues of rugged out, rugged individualism and outdoors. Um, oh, he was the one that started the parks and, uh, you know, and it's, it's similar to the question, what's your favorite park? You know, who's your favorite president? Who, what's your favorite park? And of course you can never pick the park you're in because that sounds like shameless boosterism. So you have to pick another park and well, that usually ends up being the park where you got your start. And for me, that was, well, the first park I remember going to as a kid was Fort McHenry. Uh, that was in the city in Baltimore. And I remember seeing park rangers there and just the big cannons, you know, and maybe trying to imagine what that fort was like when they were uh, defending the, uh, you know, during the War of 1812 with Francis Scott Key was out on the boat writing the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, but the park I got my start in was probably Cape Cod National Seashore and kind of inadvertently through a back door. They didn't hire me on, but I was working for a multi-agency task force. And um, it was a real uh, kind of a heady time for me professionally, but I thought, think also for that group as well. Um, it was run by this real dynamic leader, Armando Carbonell, and he kind of had this New England flair to him. He wore a Brooks Brothers suit all the time, and there would be staff meetings, and I didn't always attend those because I was just on a specific project. Um, but he really just knew how to run them. It was very egalitarian, but and the staff were able to really get their ideas across, and it was a real exciting time for that group because it was an act of the Florida of the, the Massachusetts legislature that it be formed and Armando was really at the vanguard of that and he when I first worked there I didn't interact with him a lot but then when he did kind of I shared some information with him wow he knew it 10 times as good as I did and he really just had a flair for knowing the level of information the different audience needed so um, and my boss at the time forever indebted to him Tom Camberari um, he just had a great sense of humor, obviously, for hiring me. Uh, but he also was, uh, a, you know, uh, ensconced in the literature, and he had the copy of Old Dale's book um, that he introduced me to on the geologic history of the of the Cape. And I think he was really happy to see me um, get into that literature that was there and. Um, anyhow, it was it was a, a great, and that job kind of folded into a couple seasons. It was actually the small town of Wellfleet. Um, my paycheck came through there, and it was the four outer four towns of the Outer Cape from uh, East Ham up through Provincetown, um, including Truro and Wellfleet, and then the Cape Cod National Seashore. And the uh, I'll never forget that. I just I really I, I, it was a kind of an eye opening. experience experience for me as a hydrologist I was like wow I didn't know there's a guy Larry Martin who was doing a, a groundwater modeling project for um, the National Seashore and he worked for the National for the National Park Service out of Colorado and he was a hydro hydrogeologist and I was like wow I didn't know you could be a hydrogeologist or a hydrologist and work for the park how cool would that be and there's another guy there John Portnoy who unlike Larry that would go from park to park to park and kind of solve hydrologic problems, which I thought was, you know, if you're doing that, you kind of died and gone to heaven. John and, and Larry was so talented at that. He could descend on a place and he just knew how to interface with the park staff and understand the ecology at a USGS pedigree. Um, but kind of the other kind of role model early in my career was um, John Portnoy, 
and he was at the same park, the Cape Cod National Seashore. He was an ecologist and just a true blue scientist and uh, just the depth of knowledge he had. And he, he was uh, organic before organic was popular. I don't know. I heard rumors that he played a violin. He's probably like Sherlock Holmes. And uh, he uh, had a garden and he was just very self-sustaining. And um, he was always a joy to work with. And I admired him and Larry and Tom um, and Armando so much. Uh, but I especially work with Tom and, and Larry periodically and John more frequently. Um, but they were kind of those early people in my working career uh, at the seashore. And I really bonded with the seashore. And I'll never forget Mike Reynolds, the chief of resource management at the time. And he was, uh, his father worked for the park service and, and possibly his grandfather. And he was just the nicest guy. He was so thoughtful on his door. He would kind of write on a, um, on a board where, what everybody was doing on the team. So he was really communicating to the rest of the park staff there at headquarters, what the resource management team was doing. Because the resource management team was kind of in a different building up the road in Truro. So that communication pathway really smoothed the, the um, you know, the road for really good communications um, in, in the staff. Anyhow, um, uh, Mike pulled me aside. He said, hey, there's a hydrologist position open in the park. And I said, oh, you mean uh, the seashore? And he said, no, it's down in a place called Ochapi. Choppy, Florida. You ever heard of that? And I hadn't. Um, and anyhow, he, he met with me and he uh, eventually I, I, I got the job. And he met with me after he found out I got the job. I think he, he might have gave me, a, he was a really good reference to have. And, and the others too, Larry and Tom and, um, uh, and, and, and John. And I remember Tom being kind of, he was excited for me. He's like, wow, this is a new adventure. And he was really happy for me. Um, but I think sad to see me go. And I was sad to leave. I felt like I was extracted too early from the Cape. I, I think there's a doppelganger of me walking around up there. Um, and uh, a part of me still up there. Uh, so anyhow, I arrived down in Florida. And uh, what is my point here? My point is, if I had to pick a Cape park, it would be Cape Cod National Seashore. And if I had to pick a president, it would be FDR. He kind of looms large and he would be interesting to talk to from any number of perspectives. And although I obviously will never meet FDR, I felt like I had an opportunity to meet the essence of the man in John Donahue. He's who I wrote the song um, Higher Moral Ground for. John, I don't know, he had a physically, hey, he kind of looked like, he was a New Yorker, he kind of resembled FDR in a way, he kind of had an, not an aristocratic, but he, you know, held himself, you know, in a very kind of, uh, you know, as, as you would imagine a leader too. Um, and John, I could see him giving kind of a fireside chat, so, so to speak. And uh, he... Like Armando Carbonell, he wore a suit sometimes, not often, but sometimes into work. And he was, um, he wore where he was from on his sleeve. He was from Brooklyn. He let us know he was from Brooklyn. That was part of his story. And he was a scholar, but he was street smart. And he knew he could size a person up quickly and he was, you know, gonna cut things off uh, before, not, not cut things off, but he knew how to address issues directly, early, and thoughtfully. And most of all, he was just a dogged advocate for the natural resources. He really was. He, um, it's the first, I, I knew Andy Ringgold up in Cape Cod National Seashore and I really admired him and he was very engaged and he was just a picture perfect what you'd think of as a superintendent but it was I only knew him from a distance and just working with John he um, came down in a very contentious time 
in the swamp where, although it was a, a, an allowed use, as established in our creation document called the enabling legislation as passed down through Congress, it also said that the Park Service should regulate this use. And John was brought down to solve that. And on the one side, you had sportsmen and recreationalists or hunters, et cetera, that were saying, we want unfettered open access like we've always done it. This is our right. And on the other hand, you had environmental advocacy groups saying, no, there shouldn't be this use at all. So it was it was at that kind of contentious time that he arrived and John uh, kind of had this philosophy that he had to keep everyone happy. If any one person or one group was getting was too happy or getting it too much their way, he wasn't doing his job. But most of all, and he also kind of... Um, called a spade a spade on the old, what he called maybe a false paradigm on, well, the Park Service has to find the right balance between allowing public access and protecting the resource. He said, no, our fundamental central job is to protect the flora and fauna and all the scenic values, all the historic values. If we're not doing that, then that isn't there for the public to enjoy, not only in the present day, but in the future, for future generations. And I'll, I'll never forget that. And he was just, and that's where his song, so he, he, was, he was only in the, in the swamp for two years. And I think a lot of people now, you know, 20 years later, really don't remember him because I never worked with him. Just like, well, I would have not known Andy Ringald if I hadn't met him a time or two. So, um, is there's a photograph of him on the wall with the other superintendents and his song was really written about his ability to find the higher moral ground and part of his story too was that he worked he got his start at Cape Cod National Seashore as a GS4 gardener and that was the other story besides being from New York and Brooklyn that he wore on his sleeve. And he always told that story. That was part of his story. And some of it's like a story your father tells you. You know, you hear it a thousand times. But yeah, go ahead, tell it again. It's a pretty good story. Um, and I think he was trying to signal to himself, remind himself and signal to others three things. One, hey, yeah, he might look like a blue butt. Blood. He doesn't look like a blue butt. But, you know, he's in the superintendent at the highest position, but he got his start and he worked himself up the chain. Nothing was given to him. Two, he has that, um, he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. As a gardener, you get your hands dirty, um, but you're planting a seed so that will grow. And I think, um, you know, so it's kind of short term getting your hands dirty and the long term knowing there's going to be this payoff. And that, that's worked into a song. And then finally, I think he was messaging that he wor he works with the earth. And I think he imagined himself as superintendent um, working with the earth. He was hands-on, just like he was street smart. And um, he was just really inspiring. He was real down to earth. He was a lot of fun, too. He wanted to know, hey, Bob, what music do you listen to? And time I was like I listen to Bobby Angel yeah so at his party we had a um, uh, party in Marco for him and, and that was a real kind of uh, magical night I think it was just uh, um, a real good gathering and then we had one on the east coast and at each party I sang and I had, had the uh, guitar with me and uh, at the east coast he was Nathaniel Reed a long time him and Joe Browder uh, were uh, kind of at the origin story of how the preserve was formed, and, and, and John had, uh, um, you know, uh, befriended them, and and and, um, and he was Nathaniel. Um, Nat had to drop out at the last minute, and uh, John was John was deflated, but uh, a little deflated. But I said, "Hey, you got Bobby Angel at the party, yeah," and. Uh, I think uh, Nathaniel Reed was there um, in spirit, and, and I think they all still are in here in spirit. And I think you 
you see that and you feel that at the campfire. And this is what a campfire shanty, I think campfire shanties are all about. And uh, higher moral ground is definitely worthy of that um, moniker or inclusion as a, in the pantheon of campfire shanties. Thank you.